Could I share the screen or should we wait? To... Uh, uh, sure, you can share the screen, that's fine. Okay. So uh, meanwhile, I could uh, introduce you. So um, welcome everyone to the uh, uh, Kanban Zumina series, uh, co-hosted by uh, University of Waterloo and the Phils Institute. Uh, today's speaker is uh, Dr. Philip Maney uh, from the University of Oxford. Uh, the, Dr. Maney he received his uh, BA degree in mathematics from uh, Balliol College, Oxford in 1982 and his PhD in 85 uh, under the supervision of uh, Prof. J.T. Mori. Uh, in uh, 1988, he was appointed as an assistant professor in the mathematics department at the University of Utah, uh, Salt Lake City. But two years later, he escaped and uh, returned back to Oxford <laughs> as a university lecturer. Uh, in, uh, in 1998, he was appointed professor of mathematical biology by recognition of distinction and director of the Wolfson's, Wolf, Wolfson Center uh, for Mathematical Biology. Uh, in 2005, he was appointed as a statutory professor of mathematical biology. Um, he's uh, uh, in the editorial board of many uh, journals, uh, and he was actually even the editor of the, and chief of the uh, Bulletin Mathematical Biology from 2002 to 2015. Uh, he's a Siam Fellow, Fellow of the Royal Society, and Fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences. Um, his research spans many topics, um, uh, but mainly in uh, modeling uh, avascular and vascular tumors, normal and abnormal wound healing, uh, and uh, now a number of applications in mathematical modeling, bad information, and early development, as well as uh, theoretical analysis of mathematical models that come that are generated from these systems, modeling these systems. So um, uh, he's going to be telling us a little bit about uh, some of this work. So uh, look forward to hearing it, and uh, the microphone is yours, uh, Dr. Mimi. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Anwar for this um, nice introduction and for the invitation and um, it's really nice to see a lot of names that I recognize of friends and colleagues so thank you for um, coming to listening to this and um, what I'm going to do so we can get this thing to work okay so I'm going to talk about collective cell migration and collective cell migration is a very common phenomenon that occurs in normal development just because cells aren't necessarily born where they're supposed to be. They have to go long distances to get to where they want to be. Repair. So when you cut yourself, there's a hole. Cells have to move in there to, to, um, bring the, to close up the hole. And then in disease, in, in cancer, for example. Um, so the outline of this talk is I'm going to look at two very different examples of collective cell movement. The first one is going to be angiogenesis, which is the process by which new blood vessels are formed. And what I'm going to focus on there is very, very quickly move away from the biology into quite an abstract mathematical question and focus on, on mathematical question rather than the biological question. The second part of the talk is going to be the opposite, is going to be do with cranial neural crest cell migration and that's going to be very very little mathematics and virtually all linking to biology and experiments. So first of all angiogenesis, so um, the process of angiogenesis it's a natural process, it's for example when we get a cut and we bleed that means the vasculature has got damaged. So the vasculature has to repair and um, in the damaged tissue, when that becomes repaired, it needs new vasculature. And roughly speaking, what happens is that the cells that form the existing vasculature, they basically escape, go towards the wound, and then they restructure and form new blood vessels. And there's a lot of steps going along there. It's a highly multi-scale problem. And there are lots of mathematical models describing the details of all of that. And the work I'm going to talk about at the beginning is work done with a former graduate student, Samara Pillay, and my colleague, Helen Byrne. So I've described angiogenesis in its natural surroundings of what happens when you get a wound. But it is a process 
that is used by tumors. So a tumor here in this cartoon starts to grow. Now a tumor um, has got a very um, uh, metabolism that it's not very efficient. So very quickly it needs nutrients. So it needs vasculature. It secretes growth factors, various types of growth factors, VEGF, FGF, et cetera, et cetera. These um, growth factors diffuse to the surrounding vasculature and cause the cells around the vasculature to escape, breaks them up. They move chemotactically up the gradient of VEGF and then they reconstitute the vasculature. So that's how you get angiogenesis happening. And the schematic of this in an abstract level would be the following. Here's the blood vessels. Here's the tumor producing VEGF. And so cells are going to break off here. And there's been a lot of mathematical modeling done of the biochemistry involved in that process. And I'm not going to talk about that. And that causes cells that are called tip cells to start to migrate in a biased random walk towards the tumor. As they migrate, other cells follow them, called endothelial cells, and they divide to form, the, to form a trail. And then when these, um, br these branches then that start coming off here, they can bump into each other, like here, and this is called anastomosis. And then this will be a loop. So then these have to turn into, I mean, these are just cells. They then have to form the blood vessels. And then you've got a circulation going around here. As far as I know, not very much work has been done on how a new blood vessel forms. Most of the work's been done on how do you get this motion to occur, what sort of structure do you form here, and what is the flow like? So I'm now going to go back. I'm sort of going to forget about the, bio, the complicated biology of um, this process, and I'm going to go back and say, let's model the word model that I just gave you. So the word model I gave you was, you've got cells chemotactically doing a biased random walk up a gradient, and then behind them, cells are left behind, cells track them. So how do we model that process? Forgetting about all the other biological complications. And the classical model for that is the snail trail model, going back 40 years almost, with Leah Edelstein Keshet, and then people like Baldwin and McElwain, Byrne and, and Chaplin. And here is a one-dimensional version of this. So you sort of assume that the, the tumor is a, um, a, 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 like a point source. You can assume that the vasculature is sort of like a point source and the one dimension connects the two. Or you could also view it as a two dimensional process in which you're then um, sort of projecting the, um, all the behavior onto the one dimension that connects the two things. So N is the tip cells. So the tip cells, they're diffusing. They're moving up the chemotactic gradient where C is the chemoattractant. It's known that as the cells, as they get closer to the, to the tumor, they branch more, which means they form more tips. So a cell, you know, a, a stream going along will bifurcate. So that's this term here, a branching more N forming. 
And then here is where E is the following cells, the endothelial cells. And then this is where if a tip cell crashes in to an endothelial cell, and then it, that forms a loop. So the tip cell is lost. Two tips could crash into each other like this. That's that term there. Now, what about the endothelial cells? Well, the idea here is this is the gradient of a flux. And it's the flux that's leading to the process of new formation of endothelial cells. And that's that term here. And this is a scaling function because H is a length and this is scaling between density and length. So that's the model that for many years we all used. Okay. And then this paper here, which I think is still the most cited paper in the Bulletin of Mathematical Biology by Sandy Anderson and Mark Chaplin, they decided um, to take this continuum model and they discretized it and put a bit of stochasticity. And then here you have the blood vessels the source of the chemical, and then you've got these things, these um, sort of trails of cells, and you see this extra branching happening as they get closer. This is called the brush border effect, and you can see these loops forming. And many, many discrete models have been proposed for this. This is just one example. So we decided to go the other way. We said, let's take this word model and from the word model, let's do coarse graining and recover the snail trail model. So that was supposed to be the first three months of Samara's doctorate. So what we did was, I should have mentioned that in the other models, there is also the dynamics of the chemotractant chemotractin is being produced, it's being diffusing, it's being degraded. What we did here was we said, let's just take it to be at a steady state, X. So it's just the simplest possible chemotactic um, profile you could have. We're sort of assuming it's happening on a faster time scale. And then we have the tip cells doing their biased random walk. So we have a square grid, two dimension square grid. This is the probability that you move to the right or to the left. And this is a probability that you move forward or back, or whichever way around you want to do X and Y. So four possibilities, random diffusion would be one quarter. But now we add here, the fact that it's a biased random walk due to the chemotactic gradient. Chemotactic gradient, very, very simple. So it's in the X direction for this movement. So chemotractin C at I plus one comma J minus, so it's a center difference. Very, very simple. And in the Y, well, here it's going to be zero because we only have the gradient in one direction. How do we have this tip to tip and tip to sprout? Well, you have here two tip cells interacting with each other, form an endothelial cell. This equation here, or a tip cell coming up with endothelial cell, this equation here. So we just model these with mass action kinetics. And then branching, there's a probability that the tip cell will branch. Here's the probability, and we use the fact in the snail trail models that this probability depends on the chemical concentration, chemotractin concentration. And with that simple model, we then run it. And so we get these types of pictures here. So here is the, um, the source of the um, the, the, the cells, the vasculature. Here we assume that the um, concentration of the growth factor, so 
TAF means tumor angiogenesis factor. That's some constant here. And then it's got the gradient. And you see, we get this movement. And then from here, we do an average. And then these are the tip cells. It's a traveling wave. And here are the stalk cells as a traveling wave. So basically, you, you have a front of tip cells leaving behind a row of stalk cells. Uh, Philip, can I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, one thing that we've noticed as, as well about systems that we analyze similar to what you're doing here is that, uh, you know, uh, you're basically relying on local information. What's mm -hmm. happening at each square lattice to determine how you determine the dynamics, whether yep. you have, uh, you know, expansion or branching, etc. Uh -huh. How about the global information, like the global vascularization? For me, wouldn't that also be playing a factor in determining if you have uh, this sort of, uh, you know, expansion, vascularization or branching, etc.? So, yes, that would probably have a fact, but remember, we're sort of abstracting this problem from just simply looking at how do you model a snail trail. So remember, we've, we've sort of said that um, the, the model that we've all been using is the snail trail model, which is modeling this verbal description of the process. So what we're asking here is that is that model a model of that verbal description? So we're sort of we're moving away from vasculature because there's also mechanics and all sorts of things involved in this. What we're asking here is the abstract mathematical question of if you've got one cell type moving, leaving behind a trail of another cell type, how do you model that? That, that's the question we're asking. I see, I see. All right. Yeah. But you're absolutely right. You know, it is much more complicated than this, but we're, we're ask, that's why we're asking this simpler question. I see. But, but you're right that the global information of the flows going through there would maybe cause more branching to occur, et cetera, et cetera. So it's absolutely correct what you say. Okay, and so what I should mention is, of course, of course, this is stochastic simulation, so we would do a lot of these and then do some sort of averaging, ensemble averages to get these pictures. So these are the means of many, many different um, uh, simulations. And then that's just, that's just it, to say you've got the means. And now what we do is, if we think of um, the occupancies, then we can start asking the question. So this is a time k plus one versus a time k. Now we do the standard simple thing of how you coarse grain this. And this looks very complicated, but it's very, very trivial. It's basically saying over a time step, how does the um, occupancy of ij change over a time step? And here we say that, well, it could be that there was a tip cell at i minus one comma j, and then with some probability it moved. So this is the probability that it moves, and this is the probability then, of, this first of all, it's a probability there's a movement, and then within that, it's a probability that you move from i minus one to i. Of course, you could move from i plus one to i, and that's just that. And so here, of course, we're making the assumption that this is, these are independent events. So we're ignoring spatial correlations. So that's a big thing that we're, we're making a big assumption. This is movement out. And then this is tip to tip anastomosis, tip to sprout anastomosis, um, just standard you do, and this is branching. And then what we will do is we will then go from the discrete grid to a continuum grid by saying that I minus one is really X minus delta X, and then we'll expand that in X Taylor series. This one here, we'll say 
this is essentially di dn by dt times delta t, and we do all that. And the same thing for the stock cells. Okay, so we do all that, and then we, we find this equation here in two dimensions, where these parameters, in the standard way, we get them to be limits, like here's the diffusion, the usual limit here, h squared over tau. Now here we have to be raise an issue. Remember h squared, h is the length of the x, you know, the grid spacing. Tau is the delta t. And the standard process here in diffusion, as you say, h goes to zero, delta t goes to zero, such that h squared over delta t is a constant. That's the standard diffusion. But notice that then we have terms like this for the branching. And as tau goes to zero, the singularity here. And so this has been, we haven't been the first people to notice this, been known for quite a long time. And the general idea is that, well, in the simulations, delta t doesn't go to zero. So these things are finite in the simulation. And now what we do is we integrate these in the y direction to get the one dimensional sail trail model. And these are the boundary initial conditions which are standard. So we do this to get everything integrate across to get big N and we normalize everything to lie between zero and one. And this is the equation we get. Now remember, the snail trail model that we've all been using said, if you've got cells moving along and leaving behind due to their flux, leaving another cell type, this is how you model it. And what we've done is taken that word model, written it at a microscopic level, and then systematically coarse grained it to a macroscopic level to get these equations. And we didn't. We got these equations instead. Different equations. So let's look at this. Well, look at that term. That's the same. These terms are the same. So the only difference is this term. A n and A e are parameters that lie between zero and one. Big N and big E have been normalized, so they lie between zero and one. So you can sort of think, well, if we're lucky, maybe this term is small, maybe this term is small, maybe this then is approximately one, and we've got the same equation. But what about this? is completely different to this, different order, completely different equation. So does this mean it appears to look like the snail trail model we've been using for years is wrong? That's what it looks like. So this panicked us because we were expecting we would get this equa these equations. And as I mentioned, in the process of developing this model, we've made explicit approximations that in the phenomenological model, you don't, by, by the nature of phenomenological model, you don't make explicit the um, approximations you're making. So now we have three models. We have the cellular automaton model, which is the true snail trail of tip cells doing a biased random walk, leaving behind a trail. This is the true representation of that. The snail trail model that we've all been using, the classical one, and now a completely different model, completely different that we've derived. So let's compare them. Now here, there, these are three solutions 
and they all sit on top of each other, you can't tell the difference. So one of these lines is black and it's the tip cells from the cell automaton, so the, the true solution. Another one of these lines is the red line is the snail trail model, the classical one. And the blue one is the completely different model we've been using. And they're identical. Now, I don't know about you, but if you have the choice between using this and this, I always pick this, it's simpler. Here's another example, a different setup. And now you can see there's a slight difference in the solutions between the PDEs and the actual solution, but the PDEs sit on top of each other. Here the PDEs sit on top of each other. Here's an example where the PDEs are totally wrong. And this is because we set up initial conditions in the, um, in the um, cell automaton so that spatial correlations were important. We manufactured the initial conditions so that our mean field approximation wouldn't work. So it's not surprising that the blue is wrong because the blue made the assumption of a mean field. The red is also wrong because there's an implicit mean field assumption made there, but it was never made explicit. But once again, the two PDs are the same. So the conclusion that we've come to from here is We've got a new model for angiogenesis, for snail trail model. And we've been able to figure out why it doesn't work. The circumstances in which it is not a good description and the circumstances in which it is a good description. But what is actually very surprising is to find that these two very different looking PDEs give very similar results for the cases that we studied. So what we've been doing recently with Duncan Martinson, graduate student, and Helen Byrne, and then um, a colleague, a Japanese colleague, what we've been doing is, I forgot to put my name down here, um, we've been looking at these models and trying to think, well, how come these models are the same when they look different? And the first thing we've done is realize that the classical snail trail model, we've tried to extend it to 2D because one of the problems with taking the snail trail model and applying it in 1D is that if you have a lot of motion in the perpendicular direction, that creates a lot of vasculature. And this model does not take that into account. So what Duncan did, and the reason why is that if you think of a flux, if you think of going up and coming down, the net flux is zero. So that would say, the model would say, no vasculature formed. Vasculature depends on the flux. If you go up and come down, there's no flux. But You've gone up, so you've made some vasculature, and then you've come back down, you've made more vasculature. So that's wrong to say that no vascular was created. So what Duncan did was then split up the flux into its component parts. And then by using a bit of probabilistic theory, he was able to show that in fact, this scaling factor scales with one over the gradient of the chemical, and now we're letting the chemical be two-dimensional, change to two-dimensional, and you see this is a singularity if the gradient is zero. So that actually corrects the snail trail model for 2D. 
So that was one thing we did. The second thing we did was ask the question, how come the classical snail trail model that we've all been using and this new snail trail model we developed, how come they're giving the same result? And what Duncan has done is he's identified this small parameter, d lambda over chi squared, which is diffusion of tips, diffusion coefficient of the tips, times the branching rate divided by the chemotactic coefficient squared. If this is small, we can actually show that those two models are to leading order identical. So in other words, if chemotaxis is dominating the process, or if branching rate is very small, the complicated model and the simpler model are both the same. Therefore, you should use the simple model. And what we've been able to do is actually get a self-similar solution in that case. So the conclusion of this piece of work is that we're now in a in um, part of, you know, in an era in mathematical biology where we're all doing this. We're all taking microscopic descriptions of processes and systematically developing a macroscopic model. Whereas in the past, we did it phenomenologically. So now you've got the phenomenological model, you've got the new model that we've done like this. And if you make different microscopic um, approximations or assumptions, hypotheses, you get different macroscopic models. And what the field is lacking at the minute, and is a big challenge, is how do we compare these different models? So how do we, a lot of work is done on parameter, you know, um, uh, the sensitivity to parameter values. Very little work is done on sensitivity of a model to functional forms. In other words, sensitivity to the hypotheses you're making at a microscopic level. And I think that this is a very important and very challenging area of mathematical biology, because what we want to know is under what conditions do we really have to take the microscopic behavior into account? And under what conditions can we simply use a phenomenological model? And what we've shown here in this test case sort of study is that if branching rate is very small, or if there's a large biased walk, you can use a phenomenological model. So in fact, you could look at a network and then you could look at the branching rates and you could look at the movement of the, um, individuals and then you could those are two metrics that you could measure from the complicated um, two-dimensional um, system and then that will tell you whether you can use the simple model or whether you need to use a more complicated model. So I'm not going to leave that so that was really a more abstract mathematical sort of exercise and move on to something which is also collective movement, but this is going to be more biological. And this is work with Paul Kalesa and Rebecca McLennan, at the Stowers Institute for Medical Research, with my colleagues Ruth Baker and David Kay and Louise Dyson, who was a graduate student who is now faculty at Warwick. Linus Schumacher, graduate student, now faculty at Edinburgh, and Raza, who's a present graduate student right now for Diet Pardon. So what's neuroprest? Well, these are transient structures that give rise to all sorts of other things. And so the one that we're going to be looking at is cranial. So we're going to look at the cells that give rise to this part 
of, of the body. Okay, so there are many different neural crests. And basically, the neural tube we have here, and what these cells do is they come from the neural tube and then they move along tracks to get to where they want. So you could sort of, in, a, in an analogy, think of this as being a blood vessel and think of this maybe as being maybe a tumour and the cells are moving along like this. So in a very crude way, you could think, draw the analogies. Here is, um, looking at it more in three dimensions, here's the epidermis, here is the neural tube, here are the neural crest cells, and they're going to move, going to move down like this. They got to get to this point here and then start to proliferate and form this part of the body for the cranial neural crest. Um, if that doesn't happen properly, then their developmental abnormalities, abnormalities develop. Moreover, this the cranial neural crest is very simple, is very similar to melanoma and neuroblastoma. So maybe we could understand something about these if we understand something about this. And this is just to show that Paul can get lots of imaging data. And what we're going to do is we have this curved surface and cells are moving through this curved domain, we're going to consider it as a flat domain. It's three-dimensional. The vertical dimension is about three um, cell diameters, so we're going to collapse it, and we're going to consider it as two-dimensional, a two-dimensional um, rectangle. Here is how the length grows in microns, from roughly speaking 300 to roughly speaking 1300, roughly speaking over a day. This is data of the growth. I should just mention um, work that's been done in other um, neural crest. Here's the gut neural crest. So same thing, the cells, they're moving along the gut, the gut is growing and they must reach the end of the gut before the gut stops growing. If they don't, it leads to Hirschsprung's disease. And this is where you see people having huge deformities in, um, uh, in the abdomen. And this very nice work by Kerry, Matt and Don Newgreen showed that proliferation was driving this process. Another type of model that's been proposed in the Xenopus and the frog is a sort of push and pull idea. The idea being that one cell sort of moves in this direction, it attracts the other cell and this other cell repels that one. And then you move like this, and here they've done some nice simulations to show how you can get the invasion to occur. And some nice paper, a nice paper here by Kevin Painter and colleagues showing how you can write this as a react as a diffusion equation with a non-local term. And you can get all sorts of pack information here. So there's been a lot of mathematics done on this process we're going to do the simplest possible model. And the model hypothesis that our experimental colleagues had was that as these cells are coming into the domain, they, there's a chemoattractant, in fact, VEGF, the same chemoattractant that's in the blood vessels is also produced here. So this blood, this, VEGF is produced by the tissue. And as the neural press cells come into the domain, they eat the VEGF and that creates a gradient. VEGF is a chemoattractant, so the cells move up the gradient. 
I should mention that in the cranial neuroprast, there's very little proliferation during the process of the migration. So that was our idea that you have this cell-induced chemoattractant, cell-induced chemotaxis that leads to this invasion. So what we did, simplest possible model, we write down a reaction diffusion PDE for VEGF. We've got a saturating source production. The detail of this ends up doesn't really matter. We model the cells because there's a small number of cells. We model them as individuals, and these are sink terms. What are the boundary conditions? Well, we didn't know at the beginning. We know now, but at the beginning we didn't know. So we assumed that at the sides, either homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions for the chemical or zero flux. It turns out it doesn't matter for what we're looking at. Um, in the Xenopus, it's known that this chemical acts as a barrier to stop the cells from moving. We didn't know what the barrier was when we started working on this with Paul eight years ago. Paul has now found what that barrier chemical is, but I don't know if he's published it yet, so I'm not going to say what it is. The cells we model as discrete entities, and we have them randomly, stochastically stick out a philopodia, philopodium, measure the chemical concentration, compare that with the chemical concentration in the cell, if there's a big enough positive difference, move in that direction with um, speed, a fixed speed. So here's the equations. C is the chemical. Here's the length of the domain. The domain is growing. This is a simple function that fits that growth curve that Paul had shown us. Um, in the y direction, we assume there's no growth. The growth is in this direction. Here is just a function to describe a cell at xi, yi eats the chemical, and that sort of eating degrades as you move away from the center of the cell. Here's the production term, and then this comes from solving it on a growing domain. You have a dilution term. And we find that this very beautiful verbal model doesn't work. The cells start moving in. The domain is growing, lots of VEGF. The cells eat the VEGF. The domain is growing. Look at the gradient. The gradient is very localized, which means that the whole thing breaks up because only these cells are doing the biased random walk. These cells are just doing random walk. They're not getting anywhere. So this model doesn't work. So what we said then was we said, well, suppose these cells, like here, suppose they, instead of sensing for the chemical, suppose they sense, and if they find one of these other cells, they move in that direction so that these are leaders and these are followers. What would happen then? And I'm not going to show this video, but then we find that it works. We get streams moving along. Here was the other model, didn't work, and here are the streams moving along. So then we went back to our collaborators and we said, are all the cells along the stream the same? Because we think these cells might be different to these cells. And they said, we don't know, but we'll find out. So here's what so they did. They looked at gene expression and they found out big differences between the genes at the front, at the cells at the front. They found that the cells at the front secreted various chemicals that are used to break down the matrix. 
In fact, this chemical is used by tumor cells to invade. The cells at the back upregulated this cadherin, which is stickiness, wanting to stick to something. And in fact, what they found was, as you moved along the trail, and you did gene expression analysis, it differs all along the trail. It's quite a complicated, heterogeneous system. Okay, so I'll, I'll skip through this because we're running out of time. So we did a lot of experimental validation where we designed experiments they could do in the lab, we could do in the computer, and we compared results. Simulations like taking cells from one place, putting them in another place, taking cells away, doing all sorts of things, and our model agreed. I'm not going to show you where the model agreed. I'm going to show you what I think is more interesting is when the model doesn't agree with the experiment. And this was what would happen if you took cells from the back and stuck them at the front? And our model said, well, these are followers. You stick them at the front. There's nothing for them to follow. So they just wander around. Here's the actual data. This is along the distance. This is what would happen normally in blue. And these are the donor cells. The donor cells move forward. They've become leaders. So this hard wiring we had of leaders and followers is not correct. When you put the cells into high VEGF concentrations, they will start to move in response to VEGF. So then we asked the question, the obvious question would be, as the cells are moving along, why not put an implant of VEGF along here? You don't need to do a mathematical model to compute the answer. What's going to happen is that these followers are going to become leaders because they see this VEGF and they're going to start moving up the gradient. These ones will continue moving. So the model predicts this will break up the stream and that's what happens. The stream breaks up. Another question Paul asked us was how many leaders do we need? And we said this model is not parameterized sufficiently for us to answer that question, but what we, we can answer the qualitative question of what would happen if you increased the number of leaders. So here is a simulation some leaders, all the rest followers, leaders are in orange. Now we make more leaders are in orange. And here's count. So we said, here's the prediction, Paul. If you have more leaders, they will still reach the end, but there will be fewer cells in the stream. Only this amount compared to this amount. Here's the experiment. Here's the control. Here is upregulating leaders. So yes, they both reach the end. And yes, fewer cells when you increase the leaders. But notice the scale is completely wrong. 8, 16. But we know that. We can't do it quantitatively. It's all qualitative. Now, Getting towards the end, I skipped over this when I said, look how the model works. Because look, these cells got too far ahead. They can't signal to the lead, to the followers. So there, for this to work, there must be something that stops the cells from moving too fast. And Paul found that chemical. Paul and Rebecca, it's called DAM, a BMP inhibitor. 
what we see here, here's stripes with Dan and no Dan. And what you see here is in the control, here's the number of cells on the stripes, and here's the number when you put Dan. There's fewer cells. These cells don't like Dan. You add BMP and they go back. Now remember I told you one of the reasons for looking at these cells is they're like melanoma. So the next thing Paul did was confront these cells with Dan, melanoma cells with Dan, and they didn't move. They slowed down. So this in the long run could tell us something about melanoma invasion. So what we think is happening is, so the DAN is expressed early on, and we think that's slowing the cells down to allow for the group invasion. And then as the leaders move through the DAN, the DAN expression decreases. So last thing, Paul and I visited Hans, and we told him about this, and Hans said, hold on a minute, you took this growth profile by measuring the length of the domain and then you just had uniform growth. How do you know the growth is uniform in space? And we said, oh, never thought about that. It turns out that it's not uniform in space. So what we've been doing here, this is what Raz has been doing, is looking at different growth profiles, like here, for example, this part is growing a lot compared to this part, whereas here, this part is hardly growing, but this part is growing a lot, and is comparing, so this is work in progress, comparing the ability of the cells to invade, because remember, these cells are also being affected as the domain grows. and then doing an analysis. In fact, what we're finding is that the movement is quite robust to non-uniform domain growth in space, which is not what we expected. We thought there might be bigger differences than we're seeing, but we're still working on this. So the conclusion of this is that this idea of leaders and followers is quite common. You could think in the, um, the blood vessels, angiogenesis, the tip cells are the leaders, the followers are the, are the stock cells. So it seems to be a common occurrence. And what we've looked at is, if you're going to have collective movement, what are the hallmarks of collective movement? You need to have a heterogeneity of cell types. You need to have a biased random walk. So there need to be cues from the domain, extracellular cues telling the cells which direction to move. And then there needs to be non-local signaling. So there need to be a number of elements involved in this movement. And what we're trying to do here is to at the moment is to see, can we couch a lot of invasive collective movement into those types of behaviours? And what is the mathematical way to model those in a unifying way that we can compare all different models? And then for each application, how does the biology make those things happen? How does it make the bias random walk? How does it make the signal? Is the signal chemical? Is it mechanical? Is it by creating a tunnel that other cells can move through, et cetera, et cetera. So really trying to distinguish, um, and that's what we've done here in this paper that was recently published, to try and set out what we think are the key elements that are needed for collective cell migration. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention and happy to take any questions.
Yeah, cool. Thank you, uh, Philip, for your uh, for um, for a great talk. So, uh, the, the, uh, the floor is open for questions. Go ahead. Okay. So maybe Philip, Philip it was quite quite interesting the last bit, but I was just wondering, um, you know, at the, at the beginning when you started off, you know, you had the the cells going and it looked analogous to fluid flow. Um, uh, I know you're you're trying to you know use Occam's razor. You want the simplest model, etc. But mm -hmm. it occurred to me looking at that that um, uh, you know. Uh, flow-induced uh, shear stresses and, and, and their role in mechanotransduction. You know, the, if you think of it, think of the, those cells flowing in that direction, it seemed to me that maybe shear stresses, etc., will play, play a critical role in development, right, of, uh, and how things move and end up. Uh, but maybe that's uh, something that, that's a little bit too more complicated to incorporate right at the minute, right? Yeah, so one thing that we're doing, which you know, I didn't um, mention because of the, the time, what, what they've, they've actually discovered is that the, the cells at the front seem to be bulldozing and sort of creating a bit of a hole. And so then the follower cells, when they sort of come into the hole, they will, it's easier for them to move in the hole than yeah. to move outside the hole but that but then the question of that when you have this hole where's the direction mm. and one thing we think is that is that there must be a mechanical mm. interaction happening maybe right. through contact guidance for example right. through your taxes various things like this and right. this whole mechanics of looking at what's going on is something that people haven't really looked at in this context but I absolutely agree with you because also, as you quite rightly say, in terms of getting a long range, quick signal propagation, mechanics yeah. is the way to do it. Right. It's yeah. not chemical, it's yeah. mechanics. Yeah. Right, right, right. And biology, for some reason, maybe because it's, it's more tractable, tends to look for the chemical signals. Right, and right. not the mechanical signals, but you're absolutely right, and I couldn't agree more with you. Yeah, right. I think there's definitely mechanics involved in this. Right. The, the, other, the other thing that, um, uh, you know, I, I, I was sort of hoping, and it, it seems, you know, when you were do, doing the leader cells and the follower cells, I was just thinking, because you kept drawing the analogy with uh, the cancers and tumour, uh, tumour sort of modelling, I, I, was, I, I sort of thought when you remove the leader cells, the followers would do a phenotyp phenotypic change or the sort of plasticity type thing and take on the role of the leaders, but that's not what you see, right? The, from what no, that, 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 that's right, yeah. Um, and I think that, so um, a, a paper that Linus did, Linus Schumacher did, so we get a lot of criticism when we talk about leaders and followers because another way you could interpret this is you could say that all cells are have got the ability to respond to the chemoattractant mm -hmm. and to respond to other cells. Right. It's just that the cells at the front, you know, they see the gradient, so they move up the gradient. Right. The cells at the back could respond to the gradient, but there's no gradient. Right. So right. They, they respond to the, um, just the cells, you know, just what um, other cells are. So I think the key thing would be that if you move removed the, um, the, the leading cells is that then, I mean, another thing I should say is that I've been very um, crude by saying remove the cells because what you have to actually do is you have to actually remove the tissue because you can't just remove individual cells. Um, so th that's an issue would be that even if you could remove the individual cells, if the gradient is not there, then these other cells will not have the, there won't be the gradient there for them to respond to. But eventually by diffusion, they'll get there and then they'll start moving up the gradient. Right, right. right. One would think, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's very interesting. Eh? Um, so we've done the other experiment where you put the VEGF in, yeah. you know, rather than, rather than this experiment. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, there seems like another question. Andre, go ahead. Hi, Andre. Hi. Hi, how are you? Okay. Thank you for the beautiful talk, Philip. 
Okay. Um, in the first part of the tumor angiogenesis, if I understood mm -hmm. properly, the uh, chemoattractant concentration was fixed. Yeah. While in the second part, in the neural crest migration, um, you mentioned something about the cells migrating, gobbling up the VEGF yeah. as they go. So can you give us a sense of, you know, uh, like a user's manual, when would you assume it's not uh, being depleted and when it is it's like is and when does when does C need to be dynamical? Okay, so there were two reasons why we chose um, the C to be fixed in the first part of the talk. Um, the first reason was that we were really wanting to make the model as simple as possible and to focus on the movement rather than worry about what would happen if you had. Um, you know, dynamics of the chemotractant. The second reason for doing it was that, in fact, Helen Byrne and Mark Chaplin and various other people had actually shown that if you take the snail trail model and you put in the dynamics of the chemical, and the chemical will be acting on a faster time scale, then you can sort of do a time scale separation in which you can then say that the chemical is in a um, pseudo steady state set up. And then in fact, they've shown that then the, the, um, you can do analytic work then, get analytic results on the, on, the, um, on the invasion that agree very well with the numerical simulations. Uh, but really one of the things that I would like to do is to ask the question, that if you now bring in the added complication, which is absolutely there of the cells eating up the chemical, will that make this revised snail trail model more complicated? And then you've got the question of maybe having three model structures and under what conditions can you, you know, they all three give the same answer, under what conditions do they give different answers. So yeah. that is definitely one thing that I would like to do, would be to actually revisit the angiogenesis stuff and do it properly in the sense of having the chemical being used up. Mm -hmm. yeah, but presumably the, the effect that will be stronger in some systems than in other contexts, right? Yeah, that's right. And, and it would be interesting to see how, you know, it, it, it might um, make the, um, the, the sort of the mean field um, approximation worse because you know maybe or it might make it better. I mean it might alleviate the problem of the, of, of spatial correlation, right? Or make it worse because you might argue, well, okay, there's a lot of cells there, so there's a spatial correlation that's going to eat a lot of the chemical. Is that going to make that approximation better or worse? Right. I'd love to yeah. look at that. Yeah. Um, and other questions? Um, there's one written here. Would you, Fahima, would you like to read it yourself or? Uh... Okay, maybe I'll read it. Uh, a lot is written about parameters, uh, parameter sensitivity compared to model sensitivity. What is the best way to assess sensitivity to model structure and robustness to this structure in the presence of data? Yeah, so th that really is the, the, the issue that I'm um, really trying to get at, because, for example, there's a, there's a very nice paper, I think, by um, Pennington and colleagues, where they, just by looking at simple diffusion and by taking different microscopic descriptions of diffusion, they came up with something like 12 different PDEs with different non-linear, fully non-linear PDEs, with the, the diffusion coefficient having different non-linearities. And the question there then is, do all those models behave in the same way? So even the simplest problem of just modeling something that's randomly moving, and whether you take into account that there's volume exclusion or there's not, or various other things, you can get a suite of models. And I think that is a very complicated applied analysis question. Uh, when I 
try to engage my applied analysis friends to look at this problem, they sort of smile at me and then very quickly find somebody else to talk to. <laughs> because I think it's quite challenging. But I think that this is a major problem, I think, for us, a major challenge for us, is how do we develop the mathematics that allows us to look at these very highly nonlinear systems and to, and to compare and contrast them and to find out under what conditions. So what we tried to do in the, the snail trail model was ask the question, what given data, what metrics should we measure from the data to inform what model we should use? And the metrics we saw was branching rate and um, uh, almost like the biasness of the walk. But in no way did we calibrate that. You know, no, when so was the, just as a follow up question, because I had that, 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 that question earlier. Um, you, you define that parameter epsilon uh, that depends on our three other parameters. Yeah. And uh, you were talking about, you know, when, when, if epsilon is, is very, very small, then uh, these three models become uh, equivalent three models, but uh, when it's large then... So aren't these three parameters at least that define epsilon uh, uh, measurable to, to determine uh, which one is more likely, which model is more likely? Or at least when it's, when, when it's bigger than one, then with, with me, with, with, uh, one model would be more accurate than the others. And uh, when it's below one, then they will be equivalent. Yeah, so in principle, they would be measurable. But uh, of course, the question is that the sort of data that one gets of a vascular network is just of the network. The problem is that one doesn't get the data showing um, individual cells moving so that you could work out the diffusion coefficient. Um, or work out the branching rate. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the real problem is not having, I mean, it's beginning to get a bit better, but not having the time lapse pictures to allow you to do those measurements. But that's changing. I mean, your imaging is, is um, you know, very much, I mean, it is now because you, you, you can start getting time lapse things. Mm -hmm. But you're right. I mean, the ideal thing would be that if somehow you had enough um, temporal data to measure those parameters. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. But, but, but presumably, uh, even, you know, doing the uh, Chaplin Sandy model yeah. um, and, and whether they can presumably control branching rate, etc., you know, if you increase that and then looked at your model predictions, you'd either see it didn't match up too closely or uh, if, if it was a low branching rate, then, you know, those sort of things. I think your numeric suggested that, that those held, right? You know, if you looked at your epsilon, you could either decrease lambda, the branching rate, or increase. Yeah, yeah. that's right. There's kind of trade-offs. Yeah. 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 I should also say, actually, going back to your original question, um, Siv, about mechanics, that. Yeah. Mechanics, it's now clear, actually does play a very important role in, in the angiogenesis process. Yeah, it's not yeah. just simply cells moving up a chemical gradient. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, no, it's fascinating because even looking back at your stuff on wound healing and stuff, how all of that ties in with, with uh, yeah. tumor, but, you know, sort of, and, and then now the neural crest thing, it looks like, you know, biologically there are some sort of underlying, underlying principles or things that guide... Uh, um, biological development and form, etc. Yeah, and what I was thinking of, you know, the neural crest, because it's experimentally um, yeah. tractable, yeah. is a very nice paradigm. And they're different neural crests, I pointed out. Yeah. And they're using, you know, like the gut is using proliferation yeah. to drive it. Um, yeah. Cradial neural crest is using something else. Yeah. You know, can we develop a, a, a sort of like a, a, a a general mathematical framework, which would be some non-linear, I mean, non-local yes. system. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the question would be, from a biological point of view, how do you get that non-local thing? Is yeah. it mechanics, etc., etc.? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other question?
Okay, I'm going to ask one more question. Sorry, it's just because uh, it seems to me I I don't missed it, but I don't believe so. Uh, when you talk about uh, the uh, New York Trust, uh, the the model that you have, how did you define the leaders versus followers in your model? So it it varies, and in, in some of the models towards the end, we we've just actually um, said um, we. Is it an Asian based? Is it an agent-based formalism? Or? Oh, yeah, it's an agent-based formalism, yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, I just yeah. want to clarify this. I see. Okay. Yeah. And then what we do is that if, if then a cell falls into a region where there's not very much VEGF, then at some point it changes to a follower. I see. I yeah. see. So, so it is, it's agent-based, so I should have said that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, any other question? Okay, um, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manny, for a great talk. It was really enjoyable. I, I believe thank you. I can speak for everyone we'll, from, uh, from, the, from the talk. And I, hope guess, to... I guess we'll let you go and have dinner now, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you for the questions. And like I say, it's, it's really lovely to see so many names that I recognize. And it's just a real pity I can't um, yeah. sort of see you in person. But soon enough, we'll yeah. hopefully be able to hopefully. Do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So yes. Take yeah. care. All the best. Thank you again. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye, Philip. Bye. -bye. Bye.